I'm Jeremy Narby. I'm a, an anthropologist, a Canadian citizen. I live in Switzerland. I'm 63 years old. I've worked for the last 33 years for a, a Swiss NGO called uh, Nouvelle Planète as Amazonian Projects Director. And essentially that means that I've been raising funds for the initiatives of indigenous people, mainly in the Peruvian Amazon. I'd like to, to start asking you, why are tobacco and ayahuasca considered plant teachers by Amazon indigenous peoples? Well, the idea of a uh, plant teacher, uh, as I understand it, as Amazonian people have uh, explained it to me and to other uh, uh, people from outside the Amazon, um, is uh, what uh, a scientist might call a psychoactive plant, like uh, tobacco or ayahuasca, can become a teacher when you ingest it and then pay attention to the experience that your body and mind have uh, once you've ingested it. When you do ingest these plants, you have certain experiences that scientists would call uh, modified consciousness or altered states of consciousness. But for indigenous Amazonian people, when you find yourself uh, having uh, such an experience, what is also going on is a form of uh, teaching or learning that the um, plant sets off. And you have said that your experience with the Ashaninga community, Ki Kidishadi, has changed your life. Why is that? And how has this experience in ayahuasca changed your worldview or how you think about the environment? Well, uh, yes, I lived with Ashaninka people um, in the uh, community called Kirishari in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon in the 1980s. At the time, uh, the World Bank and different international uh, uh, development agencies were funding the confiscation of indigenous territories in the name of development, arguing that these people didn't know how to use their resources rationally. I wanted to show that they did use their resources rationally and had all kinds of knowledge about the rainforest, the plants and the animals in the forest. So there I was studying the rational uses of the rainforest by Ashaninka people. But they told me, Brother Jeremy, if you want to understand all these questions you're asking about how we know what we know about plants, you have to drink ayahuasca. It's the television of the forest. It'll show you images and you will learn things. Ten minutes into the experience, my worldview collapsed in front of my eyes because I began seeing things that I didn't think existed. Um, enormous fluorescent serpents that began explaining things to me, starting with the fact that I was just a tiny human being. Hallucinations, perhaps, but, but so uh, detailed and powerful uh, that it made ordinary reality seem uh, distant and unimportant, I could see that my whole understanding of the world had bottomless arrogance. So rational, humanist, materialist, that kind of uh, view of the world. You know, that's what I'd been taught uh, at school. The world is made of atoms and molecules. It's matter and these things are known and can be verified and that all the rest is doesn't really exist you know plants don't have spirits uh, hallucinations are not going to teach you anything concrete i mean but here the experience was like taking off one's glasses and looking at them and realizing that one one has an uh, an uh, ordinary way of looking at things and that it, it is limited the next day, well, I felt better and went down to the river, and and uh, I could I, I felt reconciled with all of life, with plants, with animals. 
the importance of ayahuasca, that ayahuasca experience with Ashan Inca people almost 40 years ago, um, helped me become aware of my own limitations and the, the limitations of my culture and has encouraged me to cultivate knowing about not just humans, but about non-humans as well. Hello, Jeremy. I'd like to know in practical terms, what can be learned from indigenous peoples in order to avoid the worst outcomes of the climate crisis? I think that uh, indigenous societies uh, show uh, uh, different ways of inhabiting the earth that it, at least uh, show that it's possible to be human and to uh, have a different approach to, well, the, the whole idea of uh, that nature is this thing that you can just endlessly take from. Um, which seems to be right at the heart of the biodiversity crisis. Some will argue, well, because they're small scale, they can do that, but a large scale society will have more difficulty. Well, that that's possible. Um, still, where I think the, the real deep uh, value of indigenous cultures is, and this is trying to answer your question, um, is precisely in that uh, different understanding of uh, nature. You go to the Amazon and you ask people, how do you say everything that is not human in your language? They say, we don't have a concept like that. In fact, in our view, all the other species are people like us. Uh, it's important at this point to start thinking about how to have relations with the other species. That if you define the whole world as just a bunch of objects, obviously it's easy to exploit them, but it's more difficult to have relations with them. What the indigenous uh, cultures uh, can show us is uh, how to treat the rest of the world like your family, how to have relations with them, how to treat them like people. Um, so, and, and I think we are just at, we uh, Westerners, uh, industrial people, we're just at the beginning of starting to think about this. I'd like to change gears here. Uh, the connection between environmental crimes and organized crime is growing and becoming a very serious problem in the Amazon basin. How is it affecting the uh, Shaninka people that you just mentioned in Peru? and how to best respond to this issue. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, you know, uh, in Colombia, in Brazil, uh, there have been assassinations of indigenous leaders for quite a long time. In Peru, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, I don't know, the last 10 or 15 years, uh, uh, it started to, to happen. Ashaninka leaders have been assassinated. Shipibo leaders have been assassinated. Uh, it's it's been happening uh, and increasingly so, and it's extremely unfortunate and deplorable. Um, actually, if you've been following the uh, the news, you know they feel uh, that they are not taken into account by the state, by authorities, by oil companies, and. Uh, the criminals who come and kill them by loggers, by gold extractors, and that there's a, a whole kind of system against them, and there is a, a, a serious lack of uh, accountability. And, you know, it's it's not just a question of Ashaninka people and an area where some illegal logging happened. It's, it's about how the entire country is run. It's such a, a deep problem. And then, of course, it has roots in colonial history, you know, and so that finally, uh, and so just blaming the modern Peruvian state uh, is, is not getting at the roots of the problem. So it's a rough one, but still, uh, I, I do think that one of the ways forward is to put a value on the knowledge of indigenous people, on indigenous people themselves, um, on the places they live. And Jeremy, how is your day-to-day -day work at the NGO Nouvelle Planète 
connected with the topics we have been discussing uh, in this last hour at this interview. Local people are the specialists in their own reality and know better than most what is good for them. And so indigenous Amazonian people uh, know the rainforest and their initiatives. Our job is to listen to indigenous people and back their initiatives. So that's what we've been doing for the last 33 years. I've been raising funds for the uh, demarcation and land titling of indigenous territories for the last 33 years. The argument for raising funds here in Europe for doing that is saying, if you want to protect the rainforest, the best way to do that is to entrust it to its indigenous inhabitants who know how to use it without destroying it. The same is true with bilingual and intercultural education programs. Indigenous people say uh, we need to teach our children in our mother tongue and in Spanish or Portuguese. We need to teach them indigenous knowledge and science. And if our cultures are going to survive, we need bilingual and inter intercultural education programs. So that's one thing that we've been raising funds for and backing for um, 27 years. The, our small NGO has funded the demarcation of 6 million hectares to this day. Um, that's one and a half times the size of Switzerland. That probably doesn't say much to your readers, but it's it's 1% of the overall Amazonian rainforest. So one small NGO in 33 years has demarcated, I mean, has funded the demarcation of 1% of the Amazonian rainforest. It's not bad.